live. I'm sorry, people. So we're doing it anyway. Shit, shit, life. Whatever you do, right. you work doing it live. Uh, it's just important. So, like, everyone, just so we know what we're talking about, is Jesus buried in Japan? Well, the little known legend of Jesus Christ in Japan. The mountain hamlet in northern Japan claims Jesus Christ was buried there. Uh, this is an article from 2013. This tradition goes back hundreds of years. 20,000 or so people go to this place in Shingo, Japan every year. On the flat tops of the steep hills in the distant corners of northern Japan lies the tomb of an itinerant shepherd who two millennia ago settled there to grow garlic. The thing vampires, yeah, okay. He, held, he fell in love with a farmer's daughter named Mary Miyuku, fathered three children and died at the ripe old age of 106, which is pretty decent. The mountain hamlet of Shingo, he's remembered by the name Daitanku Taro Jurai. The rest of the world knows him as Jesus Christ. Turned out that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah worker of miracles, the spiritual figurehead for one of the world's most foremost religions, did not die on the cross at Calvary as widely reported, but after resurrection, returned and told amusing folklore. He was the kid brother, Isuku. It was his kid brother, Isukiri, who severed his ear, was interred in an adjacent burial mound, and buried in Japan. A bucolic backwater with only one Christian resident, Toshiko Sato, who was 77 when he visited, or when the writer visited last spring, with no church within 30 miles of Shingo. Nevertheless, it builds itself as Kirosutu no Sato, Christ's hometown. Every year, the 20,000 or so pilgrims and pagans visit the site, which is maintained by a nearby yogurt factory. Some visitors shell out more than 100 yen entrance fee at the Legend of Christ Museum, a trove of religious relics that sell everything from Jesus coasters to coffee mugs. Some participate in the Springtime Christ Festival, a mashup of multi-denominational rites in which kimono-clad women dance around the twin graves and chants a three-line lit litany in an unknown language. The ceremony, designed to console the spirits of Jesus Christ, has been, a stage, has been staged by the local tourism bureau ever since 1964. The Japanese are mostly Buddhist or Shintoist, and in a nation of 127 million, about 1% identify them as Christian. Nevertheless, we can go into it, but there were 30... 3% of Japan murdered at one point for being Christian. If you look into the story by uh, Endo, I think we can find, where's my little book, Endo? It's somewhere here, right? Uh, Endo. Endo, silence. If you read Endo's The Silence, a 1966 novel that... Martin Scorsese recently made into a film. It will tell you a story all about the hidden Christians of Japan and the Jesuit missionaries sent to Japan, particularly the ones in the 17th century who endured prosecution in the time of the hidden Christians after a third of Japan had already been martyred for being Christian. A third of Japan, 33%, had been murdered. They'd been boiled in oil. They'd been crucified, and hung upside down and drowned, all because they refused to give up their religion. That's a lot of Japan to be that Christian. So by the 17th century, when the Jesuits got there, they were surprised to find the Kakuri Kirishitan, the hidden Christians. The hidden Christians, they had all these symbols. You'll find inside of their Buddhas, little crosses they made sure no one was supposed to know about right there in the center the only people who were allowed to bring items into Edo Japan were the, the Dutch for some reason the Dutch were allowed I believe the reason might have to do with the fact that the Dutch used to be Spanish themselves and that they had become against the Catholic Jesuit hierarchy so they'd left the church this makes the most sense According to the Heimkringsja, which is the North Sagas by the Norse, there's a lot of stories from the 11th century that connect Mordkinskina and Fagerskina, the Norwegian histories, with the Japanese. The Japanese and the ancient Norse all had some sort of a history together. 
when we start looking into, okay, I think we're now getting to the gross Michelle part. So looking back at Japan, this region of Japan where Jesus Christ was supposed to have been buried is in the north right here. Mike, I'm going to go to your screen for a second because it looked like you had. I have a, what? I, I, I'm not sharing anything yet. Give me a second. Oh. Uh, okay, tell me when you're back there because I thought you had something on um, Shingo because this is the region in Shingo called Aomori. <laughs> Here's A. Hold on, let's go back to you. A. Morty. So this is Shingo and A. Morty. Looking yeah, down at so. Morty here. Look at the river line. Check out the different spots. This is the first time that we've really gotten the time to look into this area, but we're already seeing evidence that makes sense to me that this is a reason why the Japanese Christians live in caves. This is another thing if you watch Samurai Champloo, all the anime, there's all these stories about it. Hidden Christians, the Kiro Shitiru, lived in caves underneath the ground, hid their religion, and most of them converted. There's as only a third of them that were willing to die. But a third of the state is a lot of people. So we're looking at a complete ethnocide of the entire Christian population of Japan, which at that point would have been 30 million, 40 million, crazy amount, tens of millions of people. It's much, much more than I think people understand. And this all happened in the 1690s to the 17th century, 1660s maybe. You have a complete decimation of the population, but you know at least a third of the population wiped out. And this region here supposedly is a place where Jesus Christ would have ended up. Do you see anything when you're looking at this immediately that kind of brings of star forks to you, the way the rivers run or the way that things are working? In Japan? I mean, I immediately see that river has a point to it. There's obviously a spread from that river point that starts to like go outwards. And you call the Star Fort Hanmaru. So can we look at Hanmaru? It's, that's kind it's, of it's not very big. It's a, it's sort of an earthen wall. You can see mm -hmm. here. Oh, okay. There's the point right there. And you have to understand how much of Japan has changed over the last few centuries. It's actually a place that's un endured more change than some other places, really. But you can see where there are remnants of this. So where's the forest? Can you go to the Shingo forest? And what do we see in the Shingo forest? That's like really, you know, out there in the, in the, in the, in the crevice. So oh. here's the forest in Shingo. Well, I find it to be pretty interesting. This is a, this is something that we're starting to look into to look and see what we can find about this legend. But it, you know, the facts around it are just crazy. Just the idea that Japan had lost millions, tens of millions of people just because of what they believe. And to this day, there are still hidden Christians in Japan. Many of them don't even know that they're Christian. They just know that their family had endured some major suffering. And so they have these um, traditions. They'll hand the rice and the wine to each other like, the Eucharist in order to make sure that everyone's able to have the last supper rites. So there's a lot of weird ancient Christian loss that happened there. The official story is of course that the Jesuits brought it to them and these people, tens of millions of them just died for a religion that they recently converted to. And this is plausible to some extent. When you start seeing the number of star forts across Japan, you start seeing the culture starts to make more and more sense about this other sort of a Jesus character that was living in these places. Check out this star four right here. This is crazy. Osaka. Yeah, the other th interesting thing about Osaka, seeing as you mentioned, like, is these keyholes. Mm. Wow. They say they are tombs of leaders but then they would have lost a whole lot of leaders seeing as they are literally everywhere in osaka 
I'm just going over them. Like fairly, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm sharing my screen at all. Yeah, your screen's shared. I'm looking at it. I'm trying to prepare for the next part of my, uh, my tangent. Well, somebody in the chat went sort of uh, aggressive on calling you stupid for uh, thinking that Jesus is buried at all. Right. No, that's a very interesting point. Uh, I'm not necessarily. Uh, they, 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 they left. So. Not I, so it's just so they know. I'm not necessarily saying that, like, is Jesus buried? That's a good question, actually. I'm glad someone said that. Um, the idea that Jesus necessarily is buried might be construed as blasphemous. In fact, clearly it has been. I'm not necessarily saying I believe that Jesus is buried. I, I, and I actually think the, the people that are saying, well, why can't Jesus be buried? They're missing the point of how supernatural Jesus is, is supposed to be. So I understand that. And if, if someone's saying this is like misconstruing Jesus, I'm more than open to hearing your interpretation of Jesus. I'm just saying that there is a legend in Japan about this. And I'm just saying it's worth knowing about the place itself for the historical narrative, um, granted, I, I can see why that would be uh, offensive if you if, if everything you believe is that Jesus was not buried, which is completely fine. And also it makes sense because if you want Jesus to be the supernatural figure, more than just some sort of a mystic who is really good at yoga, then you don't want Jesus to just be someone who died. You want him to be a superhero. So that's totally fine. And I'm not trying to argue with that or take it away from you. I don't even know what I, what I, what so, I, uh, don't like is people then automatic you automatically calling you stupid. Well, okay. So what if what if you think of it like this? Like a lot of Japan was trying to figure out a way to exist with its culture and might have had to manipulate the culture the same way that many pagans had to manipulate their culture to be about saints. So they said, oh well, this saint was here. This great saged master was here. What was his name? What's your favorite saint? What's your favorite master? Oh, you guys like Jesus? Well, Jesus was here, you know, and then maybe there's a misconstrued cultural narrative. Who's to say that it's the correct narrative? I don't, I don't pretend to say that I'm sure of it. Um, here's something I can show really quickly since you're on this. There's a guy I was learning about from someone in the group recently called Shuang Shu, and uh, Shuang Shu was the uh, master and influence, influential Chinese philosopher from the fourth century BC during the Warring States period. Um, who taught a hundred schools of thought and a lot of what Taoism, which was a burn text that a lot of people relate to Christianity because Christianity has um, a move away from the dogma towards the theos. That is to say, it's more about trying to follow the flow. I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to the father except through the way, right? This kind of idea of Christianity is very outside of the normative if you're thinking in Talmudic law. It's not something that you would normally associate with the Pharisees. And this is actually the biggest problem with the way Jesus taught. So it's very plausible that the solution was that Jesus was aware of being from the Library of Alexandria, being in the crossroads of Egypt after being forced by um, King Herod to be removed as a child from his small hometown and brought to a larger trade route. What was that trade route? Well, essentially it was the Silk Road. So the logic that, the, that we're finding that these proto-Asian people might have been in some way related to Christ, I don't think is too far-fetched. And sure, I'm crazy enough to, to admit that this is a plausible thought, but I'm not saying I'm convinced of it. So, and anyone who feels like this is, is messing with their narrative, then I don't, don't feel like that I'm trying to say this is an absolute truth. I'm, I'm not trying to say that this means that Christ is anything less than um, a supernatural deity, the Son of God, if that's what you're worried about. I'm only saying it's likely that they were well-read. Christ was probably educated, if not also supernatural. At least they read books, and they probably visited the Far East. And there seems like there are records of it. So I find that interesting in and of itself. 
but yeah, I mean, like, I, I'll look at the comments more in case I'm misconstruing. Well, there's, there's the uh, uh, trouble about, man, I don't believe in Jesus, so I'm not offended if he doesn't turn out to be real. Uh, well, that's, no, that's the thing. When you no say you don't believe in Jesus, proof what does it mean to be what, the, there's proof enough of of writings about a person. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's like, for instance, how do you leave footprints if you walk on? Yeah, water? that's 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 what I wanted to 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 get at, right? There's no no actual mention of just one figure, and that's that's to me like a, a, a Jesus. To me, is sort of like a Buddha, someone who reaches enlightenment and shares that with the world, the world over, right. literally. Like, yeah. Unless, unless you believe that there is like a very biological function of the manifestation of the physical God. Because if you believe that God is so powerful, that God creates God themselves as an avatar, begotten, then that's not something that can just be treated as something that everyone can reach as some sort of a, you know, through good flexible yoga. That's my point. You can't just do enough Pilates to become Jesus Christ. No, nah, you can, but that's like... What I mean more is like if you reach a certain level of knowledge, you start sharing that with people, knowing that they can lead a better life from that. I mean, this Perhaps. is a debate. This is a debate that will like forever go on between like atheists, agnosts, and religious people. I mean, I'm I'm an agnost for sure. I don't really buy the nothing, but a lot of the Bible comes from Rome. The guys that actually killed the savior of the religion doesn't make a lot of sense to me like people buy a book that's been printed basically in rome the guys that killed jesus in that same book that they print like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me well there's a lot of room in the old testament for failure that's the interesting thing about the history of the bible it's not just a book of everyone eating their wheaties and becoming the superheroes on the front of the box are usually making mistakes and the consequences for their mistakes are reaching not only throughout their whole life, you know, all of their life to the end of their days, but also their children's and children's children for generations. There's mistakes you make that affect you and your children's children for six generations or seven generations. That's something the Bible bothers to teach. Also, that there's so many different groups that have narrated this story. There's records in Indian temples that Christ apparently had visited. There are records in trade that have to do with Nazareth being carpenters. And granted, this story might be far-fetched, but the Japanese do have it, and the Japanese aren't prone to just have exploitive um, tourist traps the same way as we do is another interesting thing about them. But when Jesus Christ was 21 years old, he came to Japan and pursued knowledge of divinity for 12 years. He went back to Judea at the age of 33 and engaged in his mission. However, at that time, the people of Judea would not accept Christ's preaching. Instead, they arrested him and tried to crucify him on a cross. His younger brother, Isikuri, casually took the Christ's place and ended up on the life on the cross. Isikuri could actually be his brother James, according to the Bible. Christ, who escaped the crucifixion, went through the ups and downs of travel and again came to Japan. He settled here in what is called the Harai village and died at the age of six. On this holy ground, there is dedicated a burial mound on the right to deify Christ and a grave left to the deity to deify Isukiri. If you think about the walk of James, the brother James, uh, the Santiago Trail, how the brother left through Spain, Something I want to share really quickly. If you look at the Basque language in Japanese, the Basques of Spain or the region of Spain have a similar grammar. It's a trip. The, the, the fact that the same grammar exists in the regions of the Basques is insane. And the symbols of the Basques and the way the Basques used to exist, it could plausibly be said there's some way that from the walk of St. James, Christ left Europe and went on a boat to his modern Japan. I mean, there's some, there's, there's some room for that to have happened. I mean, if you think about all the time Christ had, it's not written in the book, it could be a thing that really went down. I'm personally more convinced that there is a Christ like, or a Jesus character. Um, I'm pretty sure that I've seen enough evidence looking at, like, guest books and signage and 
everything that there was somebody who had enough royalty to really mess with King Herod. Let me look at King Herod. King Herod was a pretty crazy guy. He wasn't super happy with not having all the power. He actually died of gangrene because he had his wife mummified so he could have sex with her after she was dead. The guy was not a superstar, but he did like to destroy people. So the official story of the Bible, which is like, if you look into historical narrative, completely believable, is that some group of mages from Africa showed up after looking at a star and they said, look, we're pretty sure that the actual king is about to be born and they're going to revolutionize the world and unite all these matriarchies and kingdoms. And he's like, I don't like it. Thanks for telling me. Let me know who it is so that I can co-worship them myself. And instead, he had because they, they're not stupid, these wise guys, these three wise guys, hmm. they end up going and fleeing without ever telling him. But um, at one moment in the night, it is revealed to the parents, shall we say, that they have to get out of Dodge. So they leave Israel, and they go to Alexandria in Egypt. And Jesus, Yeshua, which is he didn't probably have this Roman name, was raised for a period of time, probably about 13 years till his bar mitzvah, in the most happening city, the Big Olive, essentially at the time, in Alexandrian, pseudo-Persian Egypt. And he was able to meet people from all over the world. If you look at um, Jesus, Africa, and Rice has a fantastic book called Christ the Lord out of Egypt, which is all about Jesus Christ being raised in Africa. And this is essentially what the Bible teaches. It's not like something outside of the Bible, except for the, the, the fact that the Bible doesn't have those stories. But they do say Jesus lived there for this period of time. And then eventually Jesus is 30. He has long hair and a beard. He's vegan. You know, he's been through a lot. He's like, he's fighting the devil. Like, there's, there's something must have gone down in his teens. Like, he obviously has some sort of a dramatic experience. There's... There's enough to say, like to say that there is no Jesus is almost to say that there are no Tartarians because there are characters that existed in that time that wore sandals, that were philosophical, and just trying to remove the the remnants of it. You know, we can strip away all the pieces, but what we're finding instead is there's more evidence, not less. And even okay, so I, I bring up this book by Anne Rice because Anne Rice is. You know, what is Anne Rice? She writes vampire books that are really creepy, you know? Well, she had some weird dream that told her that if she didn't write this book, she was going to basically, you know, that God would get her. So she ended up doing what she felt like she was obliged to do, was to write this series about Jesus, which is really outside of her character. So I find it interesting. I feel like it's worth mentioning. Um, and yeah, just the amount of Japanese Christians it just blows my mind how many Japanese Christians there are. And looking into Taiwan, there are so many Christians that exist in Macau and in East Asia. It seems like there's something that was changed about the history of Christianity. And we see that with the Orthodox and with the Romans. The, the, the Vatican has a very Vulcanist view of Christianity. But the... The Orthodox have uh, a dogmatic view that has more to do with the lineage of their family and their choices. Just to uh, respond to a comment in the chat, all the ancient Tartary lands believed in ancient Jesus. They were Mohammedans, if anything. So what does that mean? They believed in Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So that's not Jesus. Muhammad was what? the prophet muhammad so probably just another name for somebody like jesus as a, as i subscribe to the theory but that's like i said and that's going down in chat as well like you got atheists you got christians you got agnos and everybody's going against each other because everybody believes something different well that's the crux of it really because that's, really that's a never-ending debate right i mean if you look at a picture of jesus you can look up a picture of cesar de borgia and find that it's pretty much the same person. If you believe that Muhammad is the prophet, essentially 
what you're saying is that Jesus is just a prophet, which is acceptable to some people, but what you've created is a system then where there is not this evolutionary transhumanist agenda. And Jesus Christ is that. Jesus Christ is beyond human because it is God taking the human form and giving it more than a normal human because it's evolved to be God incarnated as a human. Muhammad instead has a connection with the force. That's a valuable thing, but it's a very different, very different concept. This is what led to the Inquisition. The Jews do not have this belief either. They believe that instead everyone needs to work together so that eventually we can kind of understand this in uninterpretable data and call that God. So it's like, do you believe there are some people that are just gifted? Do you believe that there is one person that could actually be the supernatural, you know, whatever? That's, that's what that gets into. There seems to be like more and more, we start seeing Rama. We start seeing incarnations of specific awarenesses. If that's a thing, then what are we supposed to, how are we supposed to hide that from ourselves? How are we supposed to say that, okay, things are just normal. They're just normal things that we're probably going to get in trouble for showing Muhammad, huh? My bad. Oh my God. I just did that, didn't I? I have to edit it many times. <laughs> this is live. Okay. Well, okay. So I, I find it interesting at least that there was this relationship to these anthropological characters. Um, we don't have to go too far with the Jesus giant in Japan. Let's move on to another thing. Fiber. Sorry? Fiber optics without fiber. So if you read IEE Spectrum, which, you know, you really should, which is the most important fabrication, you know, uh, publication about technology, you can find that there are natural organic versions of fiber optic cable. They're putting fiber optics in everything. Single laser beams that are used to do direct unilateral lines for fiber optics. So that light is traveling in infrared using only the 666 nanometer spectrum so that they shoot red lasers at each other and that sends data. This sort of data is gonna exist between many towers. You'll have towers on top of each other. They'll be a lot like your 5G towers, but they'll send information to each other, backhauling 622 megabits per second. Crazy. You still there, man? Mike? Yeah, I think we lost uh, Andreas, guys. Oh, really? Andreas, you still there? Andreas, uh, no response. No response. Now uh, we lost Andreas. Okay. That is crappy because he was leading this conversation. Huh. Andreas is back. No, I'm was... back. I was like, what did I do? I don't know what you did, man. Okay. So let me open this and move this from the window. Uh, Welcome back. Thank you. Okay, so where were we? We were looking at Texas Tower. What was the last thing we were just talking about a second ago? 
You were talking about fiber optics, and then we sort of lost you. Fiber optics. Okay. So, in Japan, I wish I had. I know somewhere on here I've got these pictures of fiber optic cables too. That makes it so much easier to know exactly where I was. So, in nature, they produce fiber optic cables. There. That's a start. Let's start with that. So, in nature. Um, kelp and different kinds of plants underwater produce these fiber optic cables that light can travel. We can relight it. We can start using it to create fiber optic cables that connect different parts of the planet so we can send photonic information, which is eight times faster than electric information. We call this kind of cable organic, or we don't know for sure, but if it is organic, Either way, the cable that's already under Kansas and Holland and Bulgaria, we have darklit cable. So darklit cable is being used to connect these different places together. We start looking into these stories about long-term communication. It starts to make sense that there was probably already cables that were connecting when they were natural. If we use this natural cable, then... We're able to connect Russia to Japan, to China, to the United States. One of the books that talks about fiber optic communication, listening to light and information back and forth, is the Ingenioso by Hidalgo Don uh, Quixote. I mean, about Don Quixote, which is um, Don Quixote is like a story about a Spaniard who's chasing windmills. He's fighting against dragons, which are actually windmills. So, in that book, it based itself on you know an earlier story that you know he's fighting these windmills because he's been in a war against the goddess Calafia. Calafia is part of Las Sargas de Esplanadion, which is the Adventures of Esplanadion. It takes place in the 1500s, all about living on an island called California which is off the coast of Asia. And this island had a black woman matriarchy, giant black women that ran everything. And their symbol were their giant griffins. They had hundreds of griffins. So Calafia controlled everything with these griffins. So, and then Don Quixote takes place in Spain, and he's survived the war in, with Calafia. Something I wanted to bring up, this might be like kind of jumping off, but if you're thinking about African mysticism, there are a number of rules that are not based in right and wrong. They're the maxims of Patahotep. They're more to do with what is orderly and what's chaotic. I won't read you all of them, but just so you understand, the great vizier Patahotep was 110 years old. He passed down this wisdom. He was probably a redhead. That's what it looks like from the pictures we've seen of him, which plays into the homeo capensis. Um, the texts were discovered in 1847, which fits into the 19th century uh, redisclosure. A few passages that really define the, the difference between order and chaos, according to the divine maxims, are great is the law. The law is referred to as ma'at. Because what is not law, which is disorder and chaos, is referred to as death. All conduct should be so straight that you can measure it with a plumb line. Injustice exists in abundance, but evil can never succeed in the long run. You must punish with principle. Teach meaningfully. The act of stopping evil leads to the lasting establishment of virtue. The human race never accomplishes anything. It is what God commands that gets done. Those whom God guides do not do wrong do do not go wrong those whose boat he takes away cannot cross follow your heart all your life do not commit excess with respect to that which has been ordained if you work hard and if growth takes place as it should in the fields it is because god has placed abundance in your hands do not gossip in your neighborhood because people respect the silent listen listening benefits the listener if he who listens listens fully then he who listens becomes he who is understanding. He who listens becomes the master of what is profitable. To listen is better than anything. Thus is born perfect love. God loves him who listens. He hates those who do not listen. Ask 
for as for the ignorant man who does not listen, he accomplishes nothing. He equates knowledge with ignorance, the useful, the useless with the harmful. He does everything which is detestable, so people get angry with him every day. A perfect world, a perfect word is hidden more deeply than the precious stones. It is to be found near the servants working at the millstone. Only speak when you have something worth saying. As for you, teach your disciple the words of tradition. May he act as a model for the children of the great, that they may find in him the understanding and justice of every heart that speaks to him, since man is not born wise. A woman with a happy heart brings equilibrium. Love your wife with passion. As for those who end up continually lusting after women, none of their plans will succeed. How wonderful is a son who obeys his father. How happy he is, who, whom it is said, a son is kind-natured when he knows how to listen. Do not blame those who are childless. Do not criticize them for not having any, and do not boast about having them yourself. May your heart never be vain because of what you know. Take counsel from the ignorant as well as the wise. So do not place any confidence in your heart in the accumulation of the riches, since everything that you have is a gift from God. Think of living in peace with what you possess, and whatever the gods have chosen to give will come on its own accord. Do not repeat a slanderous rumor. Do not listen to it. He who has great heart has a gift from God. He who obeys the stomach obeys the enemy. Those whom God guide cannot get lost. Those who forbid passage will be not able to cross the river of life. Again, these are from thousands, 6,000 years ago at least, written around at least 2300 BC in the fifth dynasty, probably older. Um, this is, it's interesting when you start listening to some of the rules that they have, like when you appear in court, present your courtly manner. There's a lot of rules to this that have to do with order, but these rules seem to come up more and more to become like the new order of, uh, of society. And I think they might have something to do with uh, the, the original rules that we're, we're, we're going to find more and more in Tartarian uh, history. So there's an episode of The Simpsons. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just going so scattered, but there's an episode of The Simpsons called The Computer Who Wore Menace Shoes. And it's from the 12th season, and it's December 3rd, 2000. In it, Homer buys a computer and creates his own website to spread gossip and fake news. However, when Homer starts writing conspiracy theories about flu shots, he is sent to an island where people who know too much are in prison. This is a very important episode. Um, I cannot stress this enough. This episode is very real, and it's connected to a TV show from 1967 called The Prisoner, which is an allegorical fictional series about a British intelligence agent who's abducted and imprisoned in a mysterious coastal village where his captors try to find out why he abruptly resigned from his job, and the whole time you find out that all of the people involved are essentially parts of this island spy reality. They're trained to uh, keep him isolated, but also find out more and more about him. And uh, they create like false societies. And the protagonist who's assigned number six repeatedly refuses to pretense his new identity. It's a very important show. I don't want to like go too deep into this show yet, but I just wanted you guys to know about it because I feel like this is what's happening to most of the people that are involved in the research is that we're being sequestered more and more and seeing less and less of the information that we're trying to share with each other. They're trying to keep us outside of each other's boxes. Um, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into David Rittenhouse. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, into Benjamin Banneker because this was brought up earlier is the idea that what if Ben Franklin was black? And there's been so much talk about this prince himself. He used to talk about the idea of the, the original um, Prince Hall Freemasons who started the United States. Banneker pictured here with a Moorish celestial wheel, the globe of the star system, and a compass, a um, Masonic compass, holding this Tartarian tech, I think is something that like, you know, pretty clearly he's someone that we need to like look into a lot more. His images of the, you know, the, the total solar eclipses, his astronomy, 
Look at his Moorish castle, which is built right here outside of this crazy Victorian manor. There's all sorts of a power plant. The guy was very important. Um, 1792, 792 in the year of our Lord. Bisextile leap year, age of independence. Check out Benjamin Banneker. Um, okay, so one other thing I wanted to look into is Texas Towers. So if you were watching any of the videos I've been posting about the prehistoric proto-internet, the proto-internet had these radar systems, which had these triangular posts, much like Star Wars, that posted into the ocean. They have helicopter landing pads. And these radar balloon-like spheres, these spheroids will shoot off a symbol in every direction to make sure that a 3D map is uh, recorded, so they're able to see the reality. You know that we're in Star Wars when they have this like vector plane. This is how they had 3D sight of everything across the entire world, and they're using radar to do this. So these are these secret telescopes. They're X-ray telescopes. These spheroids are, are X-ray telescopes, and it's important that we start to recognize them. Because you're going to start noticing that these exist a lot of other places. That they were dismantled for military and they were, that radar was re-implemented. And that's a big thing about 5G that we're finding today. So Texas Towers use certain technologies that we're going to look into a lot more. Um, including the FPS 6 and FPS 3 systems. FPS th uh, 3 and FPS 20 um, shot different kinds of... This is what you get at your airport when you walk through the machine and they X scan you, they actually have systems like this that they're using in order to see just about everything that's going on. Another thing I wanted to show is the Dardanians. The Dardanians are basically the Trojans. Um, it's another name for the Trojans. But if we're looking into Barbar Tartar, you know, Dardar, -dar, well, the Dardans, they're essentially another, another Dardanoi they're, they're another name for the uh, Tartarians. And they have a, an entire system um, of, of ports. And these ports are all in places that we found star forts. Uh, the ethnic affinity of their language remains a mystery. Their cultural levels reveal close ties to the Luan and the Anatolian and the Thracians. Through contact, Homer writes, the elite were mixed but predominantly Greek. The Romans considered them to be Greek as a whole. So the Dardanians, essentially, what we're now finding is the Greeks are a, a cover for what are Tartarians or Celtics. And the Luvanians or, or the Luwinians or Luwinians are essentially the Anatolian people that the Hittites are related to linguistically. So if the Hittites are connected to the Tartarians, then that gives a huge hint as to what's going on with the trade. Between Ukraine up here, the Black Sea, down here in Kuzu Wantma, and then everything just becomes African. So that answers a lot of our questions really fast if we're trying to prove that through Turkey there are Tartarian people that had bronze working and copper working or calcolithic materials. Oh, look at that. They worshipped antlers and bull horns and as such. Thracians, I think we've already looked into the Thracians a bit, but we're going to do something more pretty soon because like the study of Thracology is permeating everything we do now. We're finding that Tarasia is Tartan Tartarian, and that in the, archaic, um, in the archaic period, they were calcolithic or they were, um, they were, they were copper workers. And in the Proto-Balkan period, Paleo-Balkanic um, period, Balkan, Vulcan, Paleo-Vulcan period, which has to do a lot with the volcanoes. Um, and we'll get into that more. Let me skip ahead after we've already done with that. So, Vulcan. So, Vulcans, uh, you guys keep calling them bananas. Yes. I'm not going to let that be a thing for a reason. Here's what the reason is. Volcanoes come get their name from Vulcan, who's the god of fire. Um, in, in the ancient times, there was a goddess and a god for everything. Usually Magma they, banana. 
They've been mixing yes. them around. Hestia was the <laughs> goddess of the fireplace, and Vulcan was the god of the fire itself. The fire was held by the fireplace. The goddess of the fireplace, Hestia, was removed so that they could make room for Bacchus. So by removing Vulcan, essentially what you're doing is taking away the reason for Hestia and therefore giving power to Bacchus. And Bacchus is, of all things, probably not the best. So they He's a the real. Mother, they removed the mother from the house and replaced with an alcoholic. Yeah, they removed the mother from the house and replaced <laughs> with an alcoholic. That's a good way of looking at it. It's true. That's everybody saying volcanoes are fake, right? Well, I mean, like, do, trying to get rid of Vulcan and getting rid of Mars and getting rid of. So Vulcan's very important because Vulcan's related to deserts, volcanoes, wow. um, the blacksmith hammer, the metallurgy, metal, the Iron Age, the the entire concept of working metals and bronze and. I mean, if you start thinking about the power of of uh, a Vulcan, what it really connects to is that the uh, the Etruscans they identified him as Sethlin, and so Sethlin. Let me find it if I can get. Gosh, I keep moving too fast. Where's Sethlin? Where'd I go? You go too fast, Andreas. It happens. <laughs> Vulcan Sethlin. Okay, so the oh. god of fire and forge and metallurgy, Sethlin's. Uh, was a crafter, and then he could be construed as Seth, but Seth is chaos. So it just seems like there's some kind of a difference there in, in Sethlin. But the Etruscan arts always showed him as being someone that connected with tools and with the conical hat, which is very similar to the, uh, well, it's not exactly the same as the tinfoil hat or the smurf hat, but gosh, if it ain't similar, and I find it important. So Vulcans, tinfoil hats, protecting themselves from crazy voices. This is all connected. Vulcanology is actually really important. The Vulcans are the good guys. Um, I'm pretty sure that we shouldn't lose sight of that. And also that they use you know, these hats to protect themselves against bad guys. That seems really important too. Why would you even worry about bad guys? Why would you worry about having impure thoughts? Where do these hats come from, Vulcans? Who wears them today? Well, you've heard of yarmulkes and kibbas. You've seen the Pope's hats. Yeah, but uh, like it's all people and not politics. So what's wrong with calling them like bananas? Call them French freedom fries and liberty caps. You do whatever you want. Okay? <laughs> I lived through it, okay? I saw September 11 turn a bunch of people into like, <laughs> I'm going to protest by buying stuff. You know, that's fine. That's whatever you want. But okay, so who's the son? Um, uh, <laughs> did I just get triggered? Whoa! I'm gonna, wipe, I'm gonna wipe that. I'm gonna wipe that right off. Okay. So, <laughs> so Vulcan in Greek Hephaestus, which is kind of similar to Hestia, weirdly enough. But he is Hera's Parthenogenius child. He was cast off. He's very important, also associated with hammers, making hammers, hammer and stuff, anvils, sword in the anvil, sword in the stone, all connected to Vulcanism. You can't get rid of Vulcan. Vulcan's super cool. I'm not saying build an idol to him in your house or nothing, but there are idols all over the planet, so it's easy to go visit. Yeah, don't just buy the t-shirt. Do what I did. Careful with the labyrinth myth. I'll, I'll go on a whole other tangent about how that's a quantum mythology thing. I'll do it, but I, I'll, I'll do it soon. The happy, the happy hats. I like that one. Oh, Mars and Venus. Okay, like we're gonna get so close because guess who Venus is and guess who Mars is? They're lovers. You need them both. If you get rid of them, you don't have a very good soap opera. I'm, I'm telling you, you need Vulcan because his son. You need Mars. 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 A Mars bar. Mars is so important. Mars is underrated. Everyone's all like, ooh, Mars, he's violent. Ooh, he's rageful. Yeah, okay, he's the bad boy that you want. He's Mars is great. with a caramel filling. Yeah, Mars has got depth and profundity. Mars is an interesting guy. You know, like, okay, so... Yeah, well, so the thing is, you can't have you can't have Venus without the Mars. You need to have them both. And Venus is super important, and you don't want to live without Venus, let me tell you. So, Mars, the god of war, agricultural guardian. Oh, so, so we're always talking about we're always talking about the sexist aspect that Mars is this warrior. Well, what about agriculture? 
what about that? We don't really, really bring that up, do we? Mars is not some sort of a, you know, he, it's not just weapons. It's plowshares. It's not just swords. It's plowshares. Swords Mars is in charge of agriculture. Sorry? Swor swords to plowshares? Yeah. I mean, he does them both. He, he turns his swords to plowshares. He, Mars should be just as, as much associated with tractors and corn as he is with swords and, you know, the Kiev conflict. He's, he's not necessarily a bad guy. He's only, he's only less interesting than Jupiter because Jupiter's the biggest planet, but Jupiter's full of hot air. You know, he's just, he's constantly acting like he's so big and great, but Mars effective, effective character. And there's a reason why we celebrate March for the name of Mars, because it's spring when agriculture really takes off after the winter, when, um, Persephone, is that right? Eurydice. Yeah. Eury Eurydice. Eurydice, Orpheus and Eurydice. Is it Eurydice Persephone? Is it the same? Eurydice. Oh, right. Okay. So Eurydice, because of Persephone, is married to Hades and she doesn't want to be. And she's, well, she's. Six months a year, she's down there for each one of the grains of pomegranate trees. Stay in the underworld. Six months for every one grain. Month, one one month, month for every of the grain for the pomegranate seeds. Well, and you know, Hades isn't even a bad guy. Like as far as I can tell, Tartar, he's basically the king of Tartar. So he's living underground. He's got this three-headed dog, the River of Sticks. It's a great album. And he's got this whole place that people are hanging out. And you know what? They don't treat him like he's very effective or a leader. They don't give him the virility or uh, respect that they should. So... This Greek god Ares, um, Ares is the ram, also important. Let's go. Let's go look at that for a second. Because for whatever reason, Greco mythology is more well uh, studied. Roman mythology is given a bad, um, bad taste in people's mouths. But so he's insatiable for battle. He loves vengeance. He loves to win. His son is fear and terror, and his lover and his sister is discord. So he loves discord. He loves chaos because he can turn chaos to order. So he takes a woman uh, who is uh, essentially causing nothing but grief in the world. And uh, is everywhere she goes, you know, things stop growing. Orchids can't be, she drowns orchids and he saves her because that's what he loves to do. Um, and his father Zeus tells him that he's the most, you know, hateful uh, and disrespectful because he thinks he's so much better than everybody, but he's very often connected with Nike and Nike is victory, which connects to the Nike rockets and the Nike rockets, the rockets that uh, Just do it. they're, they, they're the, yeah, we have rockets for NORAD that are called Nike. Just do it. They're just waiting for the chance to open up and blow up all over the planet. So important stuff. And, you know, the god of Discord, I don't know how much time I should spend on Discord because you shouldn't really think about this. The people in the chat should spend time in our, our Discord, though. That's true. I am being so lame. <laughs> I can't help myself. No, that was that was the prudent thing to say. If I ever make my own, though, I'm going to call it Enyo because she's crazy, but she's fun. Who doesn't love a crazy fun lady? Well, all right, Ares. He was crazy. He liked crazy women. He's all about war. He's a violent, crazy guy. Their relationship was perfect. Uh, can we can we can we uh, address uh, in chat trouble about mentions? He's in uh, either Australia or New Zealand, I guess. Um, stories only make sense in the northern hemisphere because you have all the seasons completely wrong. There is not one summer solstice on Earth. There is two, but you ignore the second one as if the Southern Hemisphere does not exist. Okay, so first off. How to address the Southern Hemisphere. First off, first, off, curious I so. how, uh, first off, I hope somebody from Chile or Australia or South Africa is here to answer that question because I doubt the guy asking that question is from South. I um, don't, don't, I don't know. That's I'm why. Gonna, that's why I. That's I'm why gonna I, make, I'm going to pick the hypothesis that they're not, because you'll find that it's not backwards. There is a whole different thing going on down there. 
it's true that there's some amount of su- it's still warm during the winter time of the north but it's not backwards they have it in different seasons you know like the way the seasons work in the south are completely different the same re- reason they have different um solar alignments like different you know constellations that they see i'm not i forget the guy's name there's like a guy that's supposed to be explaining the physics of the way things work on the planet we have people in the discord that would be super happy to help you with that i mean i'm not trying to say that i have that perfect answer for you right but the thing is when i've been down south i found that things don't work the exact same way you don't have an equal and opposite solstice there's not the same solstice for chile that there is for you know like in the horizon but that makes sense if you look at how the earth spins or what's spinning on the earth or however you want to envision your your realm of reality but that's not this video we're talking more about like mythological characters <laughs> so not sure that that's like my um, the place i should go with that one but we can if you go to discord and like let's talk about that like there are plenty of videos now to talk about that but every time we mention it we get flagged they don't i mean like they don't want us to talk about anything like beyond like ancient ancient history like that's apparently where we're allowed to to catch you up to anything beyond that i mean you're, you're allowed to talk earth shape aren't you no apparently not unless you say it's pear-shaped and i mean there's there's plenty of people out there who uh talk about the earth shape yeah that have, that have that have uh plenty of subscribers i guess they'd be hunting them sooner than they'd be hunting us i mean earth shape what's earth shape we're never getting off this thing let's fix it before we start worrying about earth shape well one thing i wanted I'm to get an astronaut suit no you're not are you going into a rocket no you're not <laughs> it's that simple you're not getting off of this place doesn't matter what shape it is fix it first well looking at also the, i was going to say really quickly aries Moraries and probably comes from meaning my or mine or so Mars, Moors, all these words might have something to do with I statements, which is very important to Rasta. You know, to say I am I, not my. So I think the M is probably like some sort of a diminutive of um, identifying or self identity. Bella to grow. Uh, a lot to cadre a lot to cadros a lot to cadros was a deity worship in the celtic britain and was essentially the mars of the gaelics and was the bear slayer someone who murdered justly he was a horned celtic god connected to cocodicus i'm pretty sure or cocodius yeah cocodius and uh was a red colored horned figure we're finding more and more evidence of you know, two thousand year old carvings of them near Chester Fort, near the Hadrian's Wall, another star fort that Mike you can you can check out Chester's Fort on Hadrian's Wall. It's a star fort near Butte Castle, which is a large civil parish in Cambria, and some of the buildings there have friggin' giant stone bricks and slate and stones everywhere around them. In well, ancient what did you say? This is in Chesterfield near Bew Castle. Um, another thing I wanted to go into is the androgyny of the gods. So you've got a violent version of Mars that's not a man, and that's Juno. And Juno could also be kind of related to Kali. Kali, uh, there's also the demon Kali, Kalki or Kali, which is the you know not the same, which is the masculine form. So I think Kalki might be more related to Mars. Kali might be more related to Juno. And Juno is married to Jupiter. And Jupiter, he you know, he goes at Zeus and he goes and has sex with all these other women. And he makes her really upset. It's his sister and you know, they're in love and it's weird, but like you know they got a thing. And he goes and he just cheats on her. And that's not what she's into. She gets super angry. So Hera or Juno, she's very important. She's very hurt. She's very strong. And her Etruscan counterpart is Uni, 
or uni. So start thinking about university and start thinking about what it really means that you know we're all in these schools about war. They're about intellectual war, feminine war. So um, she's pretty she's pretty pissed, and I don't blame her. Things that Jupiter did, he should he should get support. He should get some therapy. Um, so she formed a triad with her husband Tinia and Menrov. Men, Menvra, and uh, so there's a trying, you know, the trilateral commission of the ancient uh, educational system. Juno was an Etruscan goddess um, who was pretty well transmuted into Juno, and Juno is essentially a fallen angel. If you think about it, like the way that they describe her, she's like the fallen angel because there's always angels that did. God's bidding and at one point stop, but um, in general, she's she's still got she's got some of the signs of it. She wears a goat skin cloak, for instance. Um, you know, she's not she's not she's not the nicest lady in the world, but she she probably could be. Like if you were friends with her, oh look at the Swazi, by the way, in the picture. That's is that censor. Is that real? Is that, I'm just saying. Uh, well, just look at. Really? I just need you Swag. to know. I just need you to know it's in the picture. I mean, like, come on, like this is ancient Roman art. Yeah, you what are you gonna do? You can get flagged for everything these days. This is a picture of Juno. You know, Juno. Uh, you worry and, about be, being flagged your swastikas, and then you wait. You don't worry about that, and then you worry about Earth shape. I worry about all. I know. It's <laughs> way more risky than Earth shape. Apparently, <laughs> everything you have said is real. They hardly care about, about, about honest, people talking about the shape of the Earth. But it's history. I'm, I'm rumbling oh, all over you. God, I love geometry. It's history. Okay, okay, so in the sixth century, the stone slab dance. In the sixth century, oh my gosh, we really live in this world. I can't believe it. it's like being. It's like being a math teacher in East Germany in 1986 when they have to pull pages out of the book. That's what it feels like. Okay, so Menvra, goddess of war, art, wisdom, and medicine. She contributed so much to her character of Minerva, the culture evolved. And Minerva, she's pretty cool. Roman goddess of wisdom, strategic warfare, and sponsor of arts and trades and strategy. So feminine personifications of war are underrated. She's a virgin goddess of music, poetry, medicine, wisdom, commerce, weaving, and the crafts. She's depicted as with her sacred creature, an owl. The owl of Minerva, which symbolizes association with wisdom and knowledge as well as with secrecy. Owl. A-O-L. Owl. You guys get it yet? I met it. Kind of like Look how big those eyes are. Isn't that infinity sign kind of like an alien? Is this Area 51 enough for you? Oh man, plenty of symbols here. So, goddess of war. Jupiter is just punk. It's all, I mean, he's, he's cool and all, but his daughter did way better. Let's connect it to Jinza. Jinza is a finger, figure in Chinese mythology, very important in the investiture of the gods, which is sort of like the interaction of the gods, which is a 16th century book. Anyway, he's a disciple of the superior man, Guangzhou Tai. Tianzhen, Tianzhen's a Tartarian. Um, he could be called Jesus. He has an eldest brother. Uh, he was cru crucified. Chinese stories of crucifixion and of having 106 year old lives, living certain ways, walking on water, vernacular work, was able to cast demons out of people. Wrote in the book, in the works of gods and demons, a subgenre written in the 13th century in the Ming Dynasty, consisting of 100 chapters. This work combines ele elements of history, folklore, mythology, legends, and fantasy. Is it possible that somebody in China read stories of Jesus two or three hundred years later? Fine, sure. Is this story very similar? Yes. Worth checking out? Definitely. In the decline of the Shang Dynasty in the 1600 to 10 of 46, the rise of the Zhao Dynasty intertwines numerous elements of Chinese mythology, including deities, immortals, and spirits. The authorship is acute, is attributed to Zhu Zhonglin. Zhu Zhonglin is an important guy we can get into in a minute, but most of his stuff was burned. The novel re re reveals the story 
of an oral tradition dating around a super guy who didn't really write that much down because he was too busy being awesome. But there were avatars like vixens and pheasant, pheasants and the inanimate objects such as the Pippa. The bewitched by his concubine, the Daji, who is actually a vixen spirit in disguise as a beautiful woman, King Zhao of Shang, oppresses his people and persecutes them who oppose him in favor of his vixen spirit wife, including his own subjects who dare to speak up to him. Assisted by a strategist, Zhang Ziya, he rallies an army to overthrow the tyrant and restore peace and order throughout the story. Battles are waged between the kingdoms of Shang and Zhao. Both sides calling upon various supernatural beings, deities, immortals, demons, and spirits. Things get pretty heavy with fireworks and black powder. The humans with magical abilities aids them in their war. Young Shi's Haizen bestows, bestows upon Zhang Ziya the Feng Shen Bong, a list of empowerments that invests him from the gods of heaven. This turns out to be weirdly important, believe you me. Let me go a little bit further ahead just to explain why. Um, this stuff happens supposedly in East China, right? And then eventually becomes the, the necessary history of uh, Southeast China, Taiwan, necessary history of Imperial Japan. Because Japan, which is a collection of islands that were at one point called the Nipponese Islands, they are collected after the murder of 30, 40, 50 million people that they had that were Christians by this new emperor and this emperor line. And the emperor has three things that make it possible for them to be the emperor. And they're called the Imperial Regalia of Japan. And what it is, is Zelda's sword, Zelda Link's shield, and a jelly bean made of jade. And if the Japanese emperor didn't have this, he would die. This nearly happened. Sorry? No, never mind me. I'm seriously. <laughs> Go on. Try not to laugh at the jelly bean. I'm sorry. No, but this is like, I, as, I don't mean it. to be like this, but I'm kind of annoyed that they don't have this on display where I can take a photo. The thing is, you can't look at this because it's that serious to them. Like the emperor once had this thing polished and he nearly died. They had, he abdicated the throne. He left, he left Japan over it. Basically he, we, we went to an Island and he's retiring and, and he's dying. Like, there's a new emperor in Japan now. I don't think people get that uh, new emperor Japan. Emperor Okay, emperor of Japan since April 1st is Naruhito. Naruhito. Naruhito is also, um, you know, like he lived in Brazil for a long time. We should get into this at some point. The history of Japan is very important because during World War II, most of the Japanese who were hurt were not, I mean, like, I mean, Hiroshima, you know, was in Japan. Most of the soldiers were on, you know, leave in, in, in China and, and places. So mostly just women and children were hurt, right? So you start looking into where were all the Japanese in World War II, they weren't in Japan. Most of them were in Brazil. So there's a lot of Japanese, 2 million or more uh, Japanese. There's an island, there's like a central part of the Amazon that speaks nothing but Japanese. They have Japanese signs. Everyone's Japanese. And if you haven't noticed, there's Japanese towns in your own home state probably too. But the ones in Brazil are just that much cooler and more impressive. So at some point, if there was no, like God forbid, if there was no Japan, then there would be a Brazilian Japan. And it would be awesome and colorful and warm. And it would be fine. So, you know, the Japanese have already figured it out. But... Part of the deal is that they believe that their star forts are guided by the super goddess Anahashito, and she got her, you know, jelly bean and her sword and her mirror from space or outer earth, and she brought it to Japan. And with that, now they're able to lead the Japanese people to victory. And here's the guy who's going to do it: the new president of Japan, um, the emperor. He's called Tenno. Um, and every every time there's a new emperor, you have to understand things change a lot. So, like now, his culture will be our culture. The whole world kind of follows Japan, like right? Like most most of the world follows Japan. Japan has cooler stuff. We use it. Japan has cooler clothes. We wear it. The Japanese are pretty much like ahead of the curve. 
that's kind of like the way things work. If you look into fashion, it, it, it's, it's just we started wearing black when the Japanese it's sort of they, they they take stuff from others and then improve upon it. Like oh, in, get rid of all uh, the like I said in the previous video, right? They 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 took the car and then made it better. Yeah, you made tiny little cars. Do do Japanese better. can do better, more efficiently. Well, okay, I wanted to really quickly address the giant trees because we have this guy, Mike Ferreira, who's making really important uh, strides in the community. I don't think he's citing enough sources yet, but I think he can, and I'm really looking forward to seeing them. I'm very encouraged to see any, any, any data that he can come up with. But he's bringing up all this stuff about volcanoes. Um, saying that they're not real, which I think what he's trying to say is that they're synthetic, which is totally, that's on the right track. Like that's, who's gonna argue with that? So looking at ice walls and silicon trees, very logical that there are milling efforts that went on for centuries. Here are some of the pictures of giant silicon, or, I'm sorry, real trees, uh, carbon trees that have been milled. Um, this gives us kind of an idea of what it looks like when you start breaking into some of these like rather large, except okay okay look at these giant like the way they're chipped away and chiseled so when we start looking into this idea of ancient apiscaconta which were mushrooms related to humans but this would have been miles high because it would have been able to extend outside of the clouds and we're starting to see how these are the mesas the weird thing about the mesas though is they've been cut down and when you start thinking about what kind of minerals that biological life forms digest would they have the minerals that you'd want to mine? Could they have chemical reactions? Are we able to make volcanoes? Sure, all of that's true. So I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to exclude that as a plausibility. However, have you seen the tunnels? Have you seen how mycelium works? Do you get how spores work yet? Because if you think that there aren't tunnels, if you think there isn't magma, if you think that shooting stars aren't volcanic lava then you might want to think again because you're missing a lot of really cool stuff and there's just too much data to ignore. So I hope you're coming into the Discord to see stuff like that. Something that Lean brought up earlier was the Madagascar Cave Diving Association. I really think the site will show you some really great data, some really great examples of, of tunnels that just can't have been made too synthetically. There must have been some sort of a marriage between the synthetic mining systems that were being used in Camp Fiagri being used in Krakatoa, being used in Madagascar, being used by the former uh, Tartarian Empire that was dissolved when the Spanish tried taking it over and when the Dutch East Indies Company was created in order to deal with it. And you can find it anywhere you want. Look anywhere you want along Spain. We're in the Iberian Peninsula right now. We were just at the Guadalajara River. And you can see where there are caverns even here. So, I mean, are you telling me that all of these Moorish caverns, that they were just... I, there's just too much going on. There's too much of a, of, a, of a symmetry going on. There's, you know, natural tunnel that exists underneath all of these aquifers. And they're, and they're, and they're, it's totally plausible to fabricate them. I'm not taking that away from you. It's totally plausible to fabricate these natural aquifer tunnels, but you need to see how they did it. Cause like, that's the way they're making energy. And where are these places? These are all landlocked places connected by weird water. Look at the hooks in, to the water why are they so important well because then they can go from one place to another place and the water is covering them so they have so much extra uh, i mean these are where agriculture can happen so much faster but also where things break down faster so that's why the deserts become so important to these places um one more thing bananas i'm not going to call volcanoes bananas here's the thing though that you should know about bananas bananas the way you know them are just like one kind of banana. It'd be like if you only ever met, um, <laughs> it'd be like if you only ever met someone with left hand, who's left-handed and autistic, you know what I mean? I'm the only, if I was the only person you've ever met, like there's, there's other kinds of people out there, you know what I mean? Like bananas, this is the Cavendish. How you have a problem with left-handed people? Oh, come I'm, on, offended. I'm, like, I'm left-handed. Yeah. I'm left-handed. That's what I'm saying. If you only oh. had me, I would be a pretty bad example of other people, I think, is my point. Like, there are other kinds of people than me. I'm starting to know that as I get older. But, okay, so... Um, really? They're, 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 they're not all like you? Yeah, that's so strange. I had never expected that to happen. I'll tell you what. You tell me think about bananas, I, I, I expect... I, I like bananas, but I don't trust them. 
I expected it to happen, but I'll tell you what. I, I still didn't understand. <laughs> this is getting real. All right, so why bananas? Well, yeah. we know they might go extinct. <sighs> bananas that you like to eat. I don't really eat these. They're called Cavendish. They're I coconuts have twice as much potassium, and I'm a numbers guy. So anyway, Cavendish. They're found by the Dutch. They were called the Gros Michel. They were uh, they're seedless, so they're easy to reproduce. Once the plague comes to the banana, they will be dead. They will be gone. There will be no more Cavendish bananas. When you lose your last banana. You will not have a banana split. You will not have the bananas will split. That's what's that's what we're saying. This is the end. This is the end of bananas. And can it be stopped? And I hope they say no, because the answer is heck no. Bananas gotta go. This is the end of bananas. And when this happens, you know they're gonna have bananas. And there's just another species of bananas that they're going to exploit uh, the 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 crap out of. There exactly. So when I lived in South America, there's all kinds of really cool bananas. Let me see if I can find a uh, uh, true plantains, maybe. You guys, you guys are being super loud. It's weird. So these are your giant plantains, which are starchy. These are the bananas I'm familiar with. I used to eat these. You fry them with alligator. They're they're great. Um, they don't taste sweet. That helps. I'm not a big fan of sweet things. Look at your choices here. You're gonna eat one of these little weird freaky bananas. What are you gonna have these giant red bananas? Come on. What's this? Is this a banana? I don't know. Is this a banana? Apparently, plantains. Okay, so I forget why this matters. You're gonna call them plantain, like plantainos. Like, oh, plantainos are the real bananas. Plantainos is fine. Oh my god, I'm leaving. All right. <laughs> so the so vault. So I hope that we've addressed that Vulcan is an important god. Mars is an important god. Venus. Well, yeah, Vulcan is an important god, but that doesn't make him a mountain. I, I like the banana mountain. Do you know what? That's a, plantains are, that's what you're telling me. By the way, Mike. No, that's like, there's only one kind of banana, and they don't exist anymore because they've been all gas. Well, no. They well, I wanted your, your friends are not being nice while we're alive, but we're having fun. I can't. I can't be sure what to do about them at this point. I think they're too excited about bananas for their own good. No, no, <laughs> no um, not the bananas. Uh -uh. I'm back on the volcano train. That's all awesome. right. Cool, because the volcanoes are important. I wanted to show you guys a bit about the male equivalent to Venus, because Venus, uh, there is a male god that is equivalent to Venus, which is very important. But that might be a little too trans for this. Con might be transversing into parts of the conversation we don't need to. So I'll just. Talk about Gem and the Holograms. No, Chobits. Chobits is a very important cartoon, one of my favorites. Some people call it misogynistic. I call it true love. It's all about oh a little girl who is really a robot. And it takes place in the late 90s in Japan where a farming boy goes to Japan and he finds a robot who, you know, he wants to have a person calm that can take care of him and make dinner for him. and you know, ask him questions and answers questions. And she's the, you know, don't get me wrong, dude, the theme song for Chobits is the best theme song of any anime. I mean, I'm saying a lot by saying that, but it's important. I don't know. And she's amazing. I mean, come on, Chobits. She, Hideki, Hideki, she, she does what Hideki needs. Very important show. So this comes up because this has become real now. There really is one now. Did you... Did you? I don't. I don't need this. I'm just kidding. All right. So thousands of Japanese men have virtual girlfriends named Rinko. I mean, I'm not saying I don't want one. I'm just saying I don't need one. So Rinko is basically chi, chi, and it's not some weird. And this is most women when they hear this, the first thing they're like, "Oh, does it have sex with you?" It's like, "Yeah, right." Like my hand doesn't already have sex with me. Like it's so much more valuable than any amount of sex can be offered. What this does is care about your day. This is something humans no longer physically have the capacity to do for each other. So this robot, what it, can, it can it can literally like call you and be like, oh, I thought you were going to want to eat that gluten-free meal. So I went and I got a gluten-free 
recipe. Would you like me to make that for when you're getting home? I missed you. You know what I mean? It may, it cares about you. Like what a human can care about a person. Like, I mean, way beyond anything. <laughs> And so this creepy virtual assistant embodies Japan's biggest problem, but really mine and yours too. The Japanese company Gatebox, who I've been following and I'm on the developers list for it. I can send you some emails if you're interested. For the last five or six years, I've been following Gatebox because they're a pretty interesting company. They've made this little box that has a hologram. It's pretty easy to make this yourself. You know, I actually have all the stuff to make this, but like you can buy one now for them for, you know, not that many hundreds of dollars. And she basically can sing and dance and all that boring stuff, but she can listen and she can ask you questions and she can say, how are you doing at work? She can send you text messages while you're at work and be like, you know, like I was watching that movie that you told me that you liked. And I thought it was so funny when they said that thing. I was just like, you're so clever. Yeah, basically, that's that's basically uh, the worst the worst thing that ever existed. I don't know; it kind of scares me, but it's pretty impressive. Seventy mm -hmm. percent of Japanese men under thirty have never been married. In America, it's raised to forty nine percent. It's going to be sixty four, seventy four percent pretty soon. Um, this is going to replace human interactions. And something that's worth noting: mm -hmm. even if you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, this thing's going to get in between you both. Because it's going to be there to tell you how to better please each other and start kind of converting you into like pleasing the other person in order to manipulate the other person into being happier. So more and more and more, you're going to go to this thing to talk to each other. That's the future. So uh -huh. Gatebox and the uh, Japanese the future version. I want. Well, I mean, whether you mean oh, to or yeah. not, somehow it's, Hikari is going to sneak into your relationship, right? Because, you know, if she, to, I, I mean, how long has the smartphone been out? Uh, that long has, enough to destroy that, most people's relationships. That, has, most, that hasn't sneaked into I mean, my I'm life. Sure the smartphone so, is I mean, probably the biggest relationship destroyer thus far, right? Like, what is a relationship? Ooh, it's, the thing, it's the thing that you're destroying by looking at Facebook at the people that you met in high school that are still interested in what you're doing with your time. Oh my god! <laughs> like, epic. Somebody put on a t-shirt. You're oh, sitting next to your lover, Facebook? and both of you are looking into your high school yearbooks and figuring oh, out who you can cute. still talk to. It's yeah, that's Facebook. That? That's your personal relationships. Okay, yeah, so Gatebox, Facebook. very important, and it comes with Hatsune Miku as your <laughs> personal girlfriend. Thought that that was someone to mention, but cute. gosh, I'm pretty sure that this is. You know, don't don't underestimate the power of gatebox the, and also the symbol is a g yeah i don't uh, i'm staying well away from that stuff yeah well you alone 150 yen i'm, oh. I'm absolutely i'm absolutely fine with me alone staying away from that stuff as far as i possibly can well this stuff is like big in uh you've seen that movie um blade runner 2 right no. So Blade Run in Blade Runner 2, the guy the, mm -hmm. he's got a girlfriend that's virtually projected. He can't touch her or anything, but she's nice to him. You know what I mean? Someday you'll understand. I haven't seen the movie, so I don't I can't relate. Well, it's not about the movie, it's just about understanding what it's like to have another thing be nice to you in a human world. Yeah. Yeah, that's be nice to humans. And if you don't get it back, well, that's their problem, not yours. You tried. Well, all right. So there's my story on Gatebox. I think I've covered most of the important things. I wanted to mention a little bit about this Tartarian character from ancient China called Wen Shu Guang Fa Tianzun, which is from the Investiture of Gods, otherwise known as Feng Shen Yang Ni. Um, and he's apparently a Bodhisattva, which, you know, if you start looking into the Christian Bodhisattva stories, then this is someone who was a spoiled brat hidden in a cave. And they were a bad, you know, spoiled kid. And then eventually they started learning how to be um, more more subtle, more humble. Um, Zhou Zhonglin was a writer during the, the time of the Ming Dynasty. And he wrote under this pseudonym, Zhongshan Yisu, which means a carefree old man living in Mount Zhong. So I think that there's something to be about this Mount Zhong place. I want to look more into it, but it's clearly a volcano. There are star forts around it. There's observatories in Mount Zhong, and um, 
you know, I mean, any place where there's observatories and volcanoes and a star fort, I mean, it's, and any ancient mythological stories is on my, it's on my place to visit list. But, okay, so Shenmo, gods and demons fiction. There are gods and demons uh, that are fallen angels from these, now near these volcano places. A lot of the time there's stories that they come out of these volcanoes. And some of the stuff was burned because it was during the Taoist period. Guess where most of the coolest stuff comes from? The 1600s. 1592, Shite Dang, which is a pretty dirty name if you Shite think about Dang? it. Yeah. Shite. <laughs> Bull Shite <laughs> Dang. Woo <laughs> <laughs> Shite Dang. Look at, look at this Shite Shite's Dang. Shite's my own word. Right here. That's my word. The novel's author was the Woo Shang. Right. It was published in Shite Dang. Shite. What a little Shite. <laughs> I'll be. No way. Dang. Shite dang. Right. But you know what? A bunch of shite dang Shenmo copycats no. borrowed elements of the plot yeah. and writing versions of it themselves. Oh, the little shite dang. Get some t-shirts oh now. Hey, Sam. <laughs> I'm actually going to go order t-shirts. I'll be right back. We apologize to the chat. We're all just too tired to be really serious anymore. The only one actually trying is Andreas. <laughs> I don't know why. No, no, do. he's doing. I know this. Is, I just, going, I just had going. a few more things. Just I'm almost going. done. Mike, I swear. You gotta keep going. This is I, good. This is the last okay. one. Later works of God and demons sure. fictions drift away from yeah. the purely fantastical themes of novels like Journey to the West. Sure. Shenmo novels were <laughs> frankly about monsters and gods, but carried about more humanistic themes. This is where it becomes very similar in the Taoist tradition to the Christian Gnostic stories of dealing with your own, fighting your own personal demons, which are personified personal demons. This stuff is the Christian exorcism stuff. There is a connection in ancient pre-Columbia, uh, pre-Marco Polo China to ancient Christianity. And I think we're going to find so much in here if we start looking a little bit deeper and we stop getting too worried about the specifics I mean, because I think the truth will come out and I think we'll be able to handle it. We'll be able to feel it. Just if you if you have any reservations, don't. If you if you need to pray, it's all fine. But like I think we we can't just not can't overlook this stuff. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, all kinds of this stuff was burned and destroyed. They thought the stories were harmful to the Christians, the same way Christianity was. There's an era where "down with the ox ghosts and snake spirits" was a popular communist slogan. They were trying to get rid of all these stories. These are the stories they're trying to get rid of. Do you want Mao to win? Do you want us to get rid of all these stories? I don't. I want to find out the truth. I want to look a little bit deeper. So don't give up. Find out more about Wu Xing Yin. Um, look into the Li Ling Shi mushroom. Look into Sun Wu Kong from the Sun Dynasty. These are some names. I'm just going to leave you with the Monkey King. The Monkey King is now a new famous uh, movie. There's a movie in the 1960s you need to see, The Monkey King. It's the most famous Chinese anime probably ever made. Um, about a king whose son takes 13 months to be born or something like that, or three years to be born. He's born in a dragon and lotus egg, and he goes down underwater into the volcano caves, and he fights yes. a giant octopus eel. Okay. I mean, like, there's these, like, dragons and volcanoes and unicorns, all the stuff is inexplicably um, there in every one of these stories. They're always listed together. Um but yeah, don't forget Master Shuang, Shuang Tzu, one of the most important. I think we already covered him, but I want you to make sure you look him up. And then we can do other stuff later. We don't have to talk about the cosmic egg now, but Abraxas is something I need, I need at some point to cover you guys talking about. And then, oh yeah, Tong, Tongata Wenhua. When you start looking into the New Zealand islands, you start finding out that the Mori, the people of the land, are not an actual ethnic group, but they're a group of more broadly, the people as a whole, it starts to make a lot more sense about the Tangata being the Targata, because the Targata were the people left from Tartaria. And there's a number of different pieces of evidence for this, but once you start looking into New Zealand, you can see why, especially in the inlands, in the mountains, and in the areas where there are volcanoes, that there was some major devastation. And that's why we're not finding as many star forts in New Zealand. As in, New Zealand as in pretty, none. As in pretty much none. Well, make it none. There's there there is none. There is no star forts in New Zealand. That's that that country sunk into the sea and then rose up again. It's like seriously, all there is in New Zealand is birds. Well, there's a there's also yeah, there's birds and there's weird 
they, they, they've killed off so many in the 1800s. There were dogs, or cra- they killed off so many things in New Zealand. Yeah, but that's a full yeah. dog that was probably brought in like uh, either really uh, late pre Maori or with the Maori themselves. Like these, these dogs weren't there for really long. I'm not fully convinced on that yet. I still think that the Maori just ate up all the dogs. But, you know, I've heard some stories that natural disaster that destroyed the Star Forge probably also destroyed all the life on the planet, which makes way more sense than the Maori's efficiently murdered off every single kind of animal that there was. That's a hard narrative to sell. And I'm more and more impressed with Beebles from our Discord yeah. uh, telling us about this. Yes. So, I mean, there's just so many great people, Odinson, Beebles. Um, Miles from Tartar, Tartar Ski. Yes. Um, Dr. Guys, you're, you're so great. Please keep coming to the Discord. Keep giving us new information. There's so many more videos that are coming out. I just wanted to, to get some of this information out while it's still fresh in my mind because otherwise it takes a while and they get it's stagnant. So finish Tomal Connection. Last thing I want to leave you with. Browsing the Yuvin Shankar Raja page. Found some information about Swedish and Finnish. There's a band called Hedniguarma. It's folk music that proves connections between the Tamil language and with the Swedish language, specifically with the Finnish words. And therefore, they got a Finnish guy to start asking about it. The Finnish guy was able to prove that there are a number of interesting correlations between ancient Tamil and modern finish if this is really the case then we might have found the last piece of the puzzle this shows where after the, the collapse after the fall of these you know earthquake cultures from krakatoa right in the fifth century or the 15th century whatever you want to call it if there's a deluge that's connecting the finnish to the tamil people of india here are two separate examples of pyramidal conquest where the indigenous people are put at the bottom and they're yet same grammar so i don't know here's some links i'm going to leave them with you you can go ahead and do your own work to look into the dravidian language connection to see if tamil is really uralic but if it's not you know come on give us give us some hard evidence because so far what we found is like trippy amounts of evidence not just that, I don't want to go too deep and into it, but like the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien even believed this. So, I mean, he wasn't a complete idiot, right? All right, and if that's the case, what does that mean about Peter Jackson? What does he really know? Have you seen his movie, Thou Shall Not Grow Old? Last thing I'm gonna leave you guys with is a little piece of that. 19, 1917 film, all about it's been colorized. It's all real footage of World War One and recordings of soldiers. And Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings guy, King Kong guy, made this movie, took all of this old footage and colorized it using the special effects they used to make the moon landing, and they made it look totally real that World War One could have happened. So I really recommend you watch this movie. Take a grain of salt because, I mean, you know, whatever. But, like, they don't say they know what's going on. These are just soldiers that are in the trenches. So I really think it's an important movie to watch. Um, I want to show a couple pictures while we're still here. Seems like the right thing to do. Where's that thing at? Did I close all that stuff? Oh, of course I did, didn't I? No, it's still here. Okay, so let's go to the top of this. Um, okay, so here I am in Spain. Here's a wall that I just wandered into. They're tearing down this building. Underneath the building, there's an entire empty parking lot. They cannot build for right now because they found that it was a Roman ruin, supposedly. Mm-hmm. And there's tons of these. Um, go back a second. But you can see like the style of the rock and the, and the weight of the rock versus the bricks in the background. Um, here's an area right on the long of a river here. There's a cave on my right side here and on the left side this river rock all of this rock is Gaelic rock So it's like built at a point when the rocks were heavier and Inside you've got these like look towers, which are these arches. So lots of arches that go to show off this, you know, this spread 
She's under she's underwater at that same place. They installed a pool at the castle. Um, but here, okay, so here's one of the castles. Look at the style of the rock above and below. These are where the Moorish caverns were. This tower was sieged for four years without being able to be taken over because they could grow food on the inside because they had enough water that allowed them to. Um, and the wall is immense, and it goes on for 40 miles in every direction. This is an Almeria. Um, here's a sandwich outside of a castle I made because I was like 40 miles from like any city, but I found this random castle. So I was pretty excited about that castle. It was super windy there. And that castle was like so windy that it was like, it's the, if any water were to exist, then the water would uh, freeze in the night. Let's see. Back. I'm so stoked about how big that sandwich was. All right. Here's one of the walls um, in the area. Some of these pictures, some of the woodcuts of the iconography here. A lot of these pictures are done by, um, by Anonimo, uh, and they have photorealistic qualities to them. You can stare into their eyes. I look, some of these pictures, when they're pretty bad, it's probably because I'm in a place where they told me I wasn't allowed to take pictures of them for the reason. Oh, yeah, this is cool. Here's your average fountain in, in Spain. There are all of these fountains, and they're supposed to be built in the 1800s. Does that look like it was built in the 1800s to you exactly? I'm not completely convinced that this is an 1800s fountain. There's a lot of these like really big, you know, uh, gothic. Mm -hmm. This is a tunnel in Gibraltar. There's pictures of them. This is a tunnel where these guys were building, and they literally stopped building. It says this was probably because they realized they were heading into too deep rock for a temporary magazine of gunpowder, and they gave up. That seems really suspicious. It's more like that this was built, and they gave. I mean, why did they give up? What was going on? It seems to me there's some weird story about that. Here's the symbol outside with the water wheel on the bridge. Like the bridge is being used with the water wheel to power the whole city. And this is like the original city. Um, this is Guadalupe, I think. And uh, yeah, it's one of the larger churches in a copper mine. So there's lots of copper in this church. It's gold too but there's so much copper and it's one of those huge churches. that's just like immense being held together and there's checkered floors everywhere and everything is just spiraling out of control, how big it is and everywhere you go. And, um, okay. Let me go a little bit further. I think that's about, I don't know if there's anything I'd show you that I really want to show. Okay. You've seen the black bells, right? Did I show you this already? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay, so inside of a place called Jada, I went to Jada, and outside of this castle are these giant. Um, so there's the 1950 pico, you know, or Fantastico. Si. Sí. Cool. Copado. So it's the electricidad or queso? Le ponen de agua. Oh, agua. Yeah, okay. yeah. Este, aquí, de que se estruya, eso. So he's telling me that this is for water. These loud things are pumping water, supposedly, all around this castle. And the guy has to lock up the keys to make sure no one shows up. And there are these big black bells that are all built with stairways in front of this church. This church is supposedly built in the 11th century. Um, in every hundred years, a wall was built for it. The more you walk around, the more weird of a story it gets. It's like, okay, so what was going on? Why are there so many sacred, sacred geometrical patterns? Well, apparently it was built on a paleo-Christian mound. There's all sorts of ruins. All of the faces have been shot off of the figurines, which looks like they must, I mean, must be using slingshots or something, because this stuff would have been, you know, this is a huge, huge place. To get through this place, you had to have been a giant, basically, just to walk around. You can't just step over that the way it looks like I stepped over it. Like that, that was a lot of effort. This is a pretty tall place. And guess what? Huge basement underneath the place. 
and the basement's filled. It goes all the way down. It's crazy how deep this thing is and how tall it is. And there's a bell tower on here that's like 13 tower, you know, stories tall. That's over there on top of the mountain. And you can, uh, there's four bells. Uh, there's three bells that are still there. Or maybe there's four bells now, but there were three bells. Because, I, I mean, the, the thing is, there's a shield for Jada. And Jada's spelled two L's. It's like double L-E-I-D-A. Like Leda. But it's Jada. Because two L's is J. And so, look at this hexagonal, you know, the, 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 the Star of Solomon and the Star of David. And each window is a different harmonic frequency pattern. And each one of them is a different... Mm -hmm. And it's all it's all roofless in the center there. Um, let me go a little further forward. Here's some of the uh, some of the architecture. It's just so immense. You can see how big it is compared to how small I am. Um, and then some of the doorway, which is so crazy and ornate. And then inside of the place so once you get inside then this is where you get it's, it's bigger there's actual roofs to it it's not completely collapsed it's filled with bricks that have been you know there for 1100 years supposedly all the statues have the faces smashed off they're missing their noses they're missing pretty much most of their their uh, distinguishing characteristics but People keep telling me, oh, well, they look black or something. Maybe that's why they're ripping their noses off. I don't see that. They're so small, these characters, that, they, that I think that's kind of interesting in and of itself, that they're not giants. These are statues of small people that were important, it seems like. I don't know. I mean, but then also all these other pictures here, you can't tell at all because their faces have been completely smashed. So, and their hair though, their hair doesn't seem Afroitic. It's not, it's not super, but it could be, you know, it could be that they're from Eritrea, they're from the Northeast. It could be that there's, a, the thing is the Semitic origin story starts to make a bit more sense. Now in this church, there's a giant, giant mirror. And I, I don't know, I mean, there's, there, it could for, be for practical purposes, but it seems kind of supernatural. Like, are you trying to invoke demons? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you use giant mirrors for usually, you know? But, and I, yeah, it's a rhetorical question for some people probably using for like drugs and stuff. I was just saying, in general, they're not necessarily for <laughs> in a church. <laughs> Look at these faces, though. Why are they smash their faces? What are they trying to hide about? Yeah, that? I don't know. Hide the facial uh, features, right? They don't want to know what yeah. kind of people these people looked like. Maybe they looked Asian. Maybe they looked white. Maybe they looked black. It's like a completely disfigured. But gosh, look at the style of the stonework. It's so impressive. Like actual chainmail. Super clean cuts. And an empty altar. This is where some of these bodies would go. So, I mean, I've got tons of this footage. I'm going to probably have to just put it up on, like, a video. Oh, well. Yeah, man, just edit edit all that stuff together. Well, I was right there. I figured I'd show. Here's an organ. So the organs that they had, and they seem like the keyboards actually had some sort of an important practical purpose. They're not just for something else. I think the, key, I mean, the fact the keyboards are associated with them, they, they really were part of the original use for these things. And that they use ivory keys from giant elephants. Kind of interesting. So there's something to this. I mean, at least in terms of the, the intention of the artists that created these things, they thought they had some magical powers. And man, if they didn't make this place sound crazy loud. All right. I think I've showed enough. Pretty happy with that. Thanks for watching my videos. Thanks for being a part of them, you guys. Yeah, join the Discord, too, for more discourse about uh, all of this stuff. Go to TartaryNova.com. TartaryNova.com, and you get a link to the Discord. Support if us. you already have a Discord, 
don't do that. Just look up the Certus Tottery. Otherwise, you'll get end up with a double account. X I R T U S excerpt. So, everybody, um, Lynn, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we cut off? Oh, uh, no. All right, okay. guys. Yeah. <laughs> Lynn, nice job. Back. Good job. I'm glad that you came through here. We'll do another video soon. Thanks a lot for being here. For sure. Talk to you guys later. Thank you. All right, cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. Right, cheers.